everybody. We have a very special guest today. We have uh, Matthijs Rodan here uh, to talk about his uh, ancient article. I'm taking you back a decade, I believe now, uh, uh, titled The Nucleus of Populism in Search of the Lowest Common Denominator, which was published in Government and Opposition in 2014. So uh, welcome. Say hi. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Cool to be here. <laughs> All right. So, so tell us about this article. Where does it come from? You you told me it's like a decade. It, it only looks like four years, but it's not. It's 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 or six years, but uh, it's not. It's a decade. So tell tell me about this article. Where did the idea come from? And yeah, yeah, yeah it was it was part. I started my PhD in two thousand and eight. The end of yeah two thousand and eight two thousand and nine. And I was um, um, I was reading a lot, of course. It was about populism, my dissertation. I was reading a lot about the topic, um, and I discovered relatively soon that there were many definitions out there, but also that there were different literatures on populism. Right. So you had the American literature, the Latin American literature, the European literature, and they were um, really different from each other. And um, I just, what I wanted to know if there were populists in Latin America, populists in Europe, but there were populists according to these different literatures. So I wanted to know if uh, Peron in, uh, in Argentina, Latin America, uh, Latin American populist would also be a populist according to European standards, so to say, and, and whether Berlusconi in Italy would also be a populist according to the Latin American literature, for instance. Um, and that was a, a, a question I, I had when I started my PhD in 2009. So this was immediately one of my topics, one of the things I wanted to investigate. Um, so I started thinking about it, I think, in 2009. And then the first version of the paper was written, I think, in 2010. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, this is decade. a decade, more than a decade ago. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I suppose the 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 question you already laid out, you wanted to see if I mean you were you, you're from Europe and uh, you were interested in these European populists, but then you saw this whole Latin American research agenda. This is uh, this is actually really funny because I, I I can connect to this. I started populism research much later than you have. Uh, by and I was dragged into it by uh, by Kirk Hawkins uh, predominantly who was uh, visiting at uh, Central European University at the time and uh, doing a bunch of speech coding with our students who uh, have the advantage of knowing a million languages. And uh, and uh, and then later on by Bruno Castaño Silva, who was one of our PhD students interested in this. And everybody was like, well, populism, who, who cares? I mean, this this is this, this is this is an off topic. Nobody's gonna care about this one, right? So so but he was all i mean he's brazilian so so he was also a latin americanist and and i was always looking at populism as this well there's there's these latin american is studying like really leftist parties right <laughs> and yeah. uh, and there are these europeans studying uh well what seems to be radical right parties and uh, and uh this costs mass confusion and uh, in a way i think team populism got together to uh, to basically study the phenomenon comparatively now it just says that you were way ahead of us all of us in trying to figure this out right well kirk was way ahead of me <laughs> he was uh, i think yeah his book is from 2010 i guess about chavez and I think yeah. what is really what is really interesting, he wrote this book about Chavez, right? So it's it really focuses mm -hmm. on this specific case. But he comes from a, he is a comparativist, so he start he, he also uh, mentions he mentions the, the the Latin American literature, but also the European literature. And I think what what makes his work very original and important is that he combines the two literatures. And I think he is one of the well not. Not really the first, but he's one of the few people back then who really uh, combines these literatures. And also, by the way, the the the, the U.S. literature of populism. Um, yeah. And and he comes up with the def definition that is applicable to many different cases mm -hmm. uh, across time. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about what you what you uh, found. You said you wanted the the lowest common denominator. Um, 
how did you go about doing this? I, I like research design, so th this is no secret. So, uh, so how did you how did you go about doing this? Yeah, so it was it, it it was it was kind of a puzzle as well, and I was struggling with it. Um, but my um, so the idea was this: we have this concept of of of, of populism, and we have all these actors, uh, parties, politicians, and they are categorized as populist. Um, and um, my basically my, my, my question was, do all these different uh, actors have something in common? Like you said, right, in, 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 in Europe, we had the far right parties that are uh, uh, called populist. In Latin America, you had the, uh, uh, the far left wing parties and politicians that were called populist. In the United States, you had this, this, these, these, these strange movements and uh, billionaire businessmen uh, uh, who were called populist. Um, so, what is it that they actually have in common? And um, this was the, the, my big question. And I thought the only way to really answer that question, to 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 discover whether there is a lowest common denominator, is to compare cases to each other that are fundamentally different from each other. So they have to be very, very different from each other in terms of uh, uh, the ideology they endorse. So uh, from left wing to right wing, from progressive to conservative, in terms of the country they come from. So I focus on Latin America, on, on Europe, on the United States, uh, but also in the, 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 the time uh, period in which they were active. So I focus on uh, the end of the 19th century until, well, not today anymore, anymore but the, the, the 2000s and, uh, uh, and afterwards. Um, so that, is, uh, that was my, 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 my goal. So do all these very, very different political actors who are all described as populist by their regional literature, do they actually have something in common? That was the main question. Mm -hmm. And of course, to do this, you need to conceptualize populism as well. So, yeah. uh, so I, I like the approach. You, it seems like you kind of grabbed onto. Well, let's look at multiple definitions. Let's look at what what would be kind of the the quote unquote maximal approach of of let's take everything into account that yeah. uh, that counts towards populism, and let's try to reduce it down to what applies to all of these very diverse set of cases, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. So, so uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, so that's what what I did. I I I just wanted to. Uh, there were, of course, there were already some some uh, definitions out there, uh, popular de definitions as well. Uh, we mentioned Kirk Hawkins. Uh, his definition was there, uh, and, and this def definition was used relatively often. Also, Kasmuda's definition of populism was there. Um, but what I wanted to do, I wanted to collect basically all features that were associated with populism in terms of ideas, in terms of uh, style, in terms of how these parties or leaders organize. And I wanted to see which of these features um, uh, were shared by all, well, I, I could not, of course, investigate all populists, but at least by the uh, selected very different six uh, uh, populists. Um, and I wanted to know, uh, uh, I, so what I did, I, I collected, I think, 12 uh, characteristics, uh, populist characteristics, um, and I just basically examined to what extent these 12 characteristics could be uh, found among the six political actors mm -hmm. that I selected. Yeah, and I would say the most characteristics came from from uh, kind of the ideational approach to populism. That the populism yeah. is ideas. I can read them off. I have, a, I have them right here. So we have people centrism, anti elitism, the homogeneity of people. We have direct democracy, exclusionism, uh, and a proclamation of crisis. So these were the the ideas. Uh, yeah. um, set and then you had style, which is simple language, direct communication, um, kind of to circumvent uh, mitigating institutions. Uh, we had uh, um, you know, populists get get polarized to get their points across, 
uh, and and uh, create an outsider image that they are not part of the the elite which uh, you know if you think about it when it comes to billionaires uh, and uh, and politicians i mean they're almost by definition the elites but but they create the image that they're not yeah. uh, and then you had organization which is uh, we had the, the the centralization of uh, of the charismatic leader uh, so kind of putting the the leader in the center get rid of uh, uh, intermediaries and loose structure in organizations. So, so this was kind of the maximal definition. Is, is this comprehensive? I know you tried to sell it as comprehensive at the time, but do you think this is comprehensive? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think these were the, the most important, I think these were the most important features discussed in the literature, but there, I mean, back then uh, the, the, the concept was already fashionable nothing compared to what happened after 2016 right after brexit yes. and trump but still <laughs> it was already quite fashionable and populism was associated with many many different things so i really focused on the the, the serious literature uh, uh, um, uh, uh, on populism and i think i still think that these 12 were uh, the most important features uh, of populism discussed in the literature so far but there was more, of mm -hmm. course. It's not all. And if you had to say what is like the most important thing that's missing, is there anything that comes to mind? Um, um, good question. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you the one I was what? thinking about. So th there, there is that literature uh, that looks at populism from an economic point of view. And I yeah. can't remember the citation off the top of my head. It's very Latin America focused, talks about how populists are almost like these neo-communist uh, redistribution yeah. to the people kind of kind of deal. It's, it's a very Latin America focused uh, literature. I think it, it by definition does not apply to, to right-wing populists in Europe or most right-wing populists in Europe. There's a little bit of that going on there, but so it, it's all, it would almost be like a, like a straw man to, to put that out there as, as, as the addition, because it, it would clearly not work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I also think that uh, I am, of course, a European, right? And I was also, yeah. uh, uh, I think I am also influenced by the European literature and maybe even more important by the uh, politicians in Europe. Mm -hmm. So I, when I, th when I th thought and still think about populism or related concepts, I, the first party or politician I think of, or politicians or parties I think of are European parties and politicians. So I am also affected by my regional, uh, the, the place I come from. So I think, uh, uh, and this is also true for the, uh, the, the literatures I focus most strongly on, the, the literatures that study those parties and politicians. So I think that um, the way in which I frame these 12 features also reveals to some extent my bias as European. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that uh, someone from Latin America uh, would have, might have selected different uh, uh, features, not on purpose, but just because he or she would be biased because, uh, uh, because of coming from this other part of the world and be because um, this will lead to um, um, different well, basically different ideas about populism before you start investigating it, because you automatically link the concept to existing parties. And these parties come from the, the countries you know best, usually. So yeah. I think everybody will be biased. And I was also biased. And I think the 12 characteristics here will be a result of this slight bias. But also the, uh, the six populists I have selected here will be the result of that to some extent. Yeah, though I have to say that that I mean now now you're very critical of, of your own work, but let 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 let's be clear. No, the past but, yeah. ten years has really vindicated the, any of your biases because because what you arrived at as the conclusion, which we haven't talked about yet, but what you arrived at is exactly what everybody's been using as the main definition of populism. So or or not exactly, but predominantly in the ballpark yeah. of, of of what what people have been agreeing on that yeah this is what populism is. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, but to some extent it's self-critique, but I think it's more it's more fundamental. So I think that mm -hmm. that the choices you make um, uh, th that there will always be some bias in there, and that is, and, and I'm not the only one uh, doing that, right? Every, uh, that, that's true for everybody, basically. And um, the only thing I I I think that um, um, yeah, so so let's let's frame it differently. I think that someone with uh, uh, another um, just another history would have focused on, would have written it differently. And it might still have led to the same conclusions, right? It could have been that, uh, that, that someone else from the US would have come with 15 features with overlap with the features I selected. But I still think, and there I, uh, this links to what you just said, I still think that uh, he or she would have come to, the, to very similar conclusions about the four characteristics that in the end, um, um, are the core features of populists, according to this uh, study. So I think that the point of departure um, will be different depending on where you come from, what your ideas are, what what the country is you are from, what the literature is you are most what, what the literature is you are most familiar with. But I think that the the, the, conclu the conclusions, the outcome in the end, that they would have been very similar. Uh, that I would have come to similar conclusions as someone from Argentina or the United States or wherever. Yeah. And that is almost by definition because, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm saying this with hindsight, but, but kind of the, 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 the things that, uh, that came out as, as, as the central component of populism are the, are, are kind of the, the most most obvious and le less con least contested one maybe 10 yeah. years ago they were not so much but yeah um i suppose uh, what matters in this respect is is the cases you choose as well so let's let's uh, run through quickly the cases that you you chose so you you started with uh, the us uh, the american people's party from the late 1800s uh, with the Omaha platform is something that people have heard of. If uh, somebody looks at Kirk Hawkins' speech codings, the Omaha platform <laughs> is one of the anchor texts as that's used for training. Like this is populism. So, yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, so, yeah. Uh, Ross Perot, who is the the billionaire American you have mentioned, uh, you uh, maybe people thought it was Trump, but. Remember when this paper was written? It's not Trump. It's actually Ross Perot who ran for president 1992, I believe. Yeah. Um, uh, we had uh, Peron from Argentina. We had Chavez from Venezuela. Le Pen from uh, from France and Berlusconi from Italy. And you picked one more case, which I didn't put in the notes. But uh, but you want to talk about why you picked that case because that's actually interesting from research design perspective yeah so i also wanted to uh to include a case that was um not really a case that was not a prototypical populist case a case that people that that's a borderline case a case on which uh people disagree whether it is populist or not and that was the dutch socialist party um mm -hmm. a, a very interesting uh, uh party because um it was it it, it it was a communist party when it was founded, but then it developed into a, a far left populist party uh, in the 90s. Uh, uh, in those years, the party strongly emphasized um, uh, that the political and economic elite was uh, detached from ordinary citizens and their, uh, uh, their symbol was a tomato and it, it, it was uh, because they wanted to throw the tomato at the politicians and uh, the bankers, etc. And they wanted more. Uh, they, they wanted to give power back to ordinary citizens, right? So that was uh, the, the main goal. And also, their, their slogan was "Vote against, vote SP." So the party was strongly populist in the in, in the nineties. However, um, um, after the nineties, uh, or already by the end of the nineties, the party became much less populist. So uh, by now, the party it's it's. Um, I would still, I'm, 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 I'm hesitant about it. I really don't know. I'm always uh, uh, doubting whether I should defi define the Socialist Party as populist or not, because they are much less populist, that is clear. 
but it goes with ups and downs. So sometimes the party is pretty populist again, and then it goes away again, and the party really positions itself as a, 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 a as a, a radical left party, a democratic socialist party, but not really populist anymore. But then a year later, it might be that it that populist the populism increases again. That's also one of the reasons why uh, it, it, it does make sense to look at populism as a matter of degree, but that's another uh, story. Yeah. It can be more or less yeah. populist, right? Um, but I wanted to, uh, to see if, uh, if, the, uh, if this party that was, uh, uh, well, strongly populist in the 90s, not that strongly populist in the 2000s anymore, whether this party also shared the same characteristics as the other parties that I studied. Yeah, that makes sense. And I actually don't have a problem with a party like being populist in one year and not populist in another, or at least changing their degree of populism. So that that's yeah. uh, that, that's not something I would totally rule out uh, as a possibility. All right. So what you find? What are the out of the twelve? What what is it that that applies to uh, to uh, to all cases consistently? Yeah, it's basically the, it's only the ideational ones. So focusing on ideas. So um, uh, it's in, when it comes to style or organization, I think the most important finding is that there is nothing that all parties share. So uh, for instance, I think what's really interesting is the, the, what you just mentioned, the People's Party text, which is one of the anchor texts in, uh, in this content analysis training. Uh, is a very interesting one because it's very populist when it comes to uh, the message in this text. But what is also very interesting is that when you look back, that these, uh, in general, the texts of this 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 movement are uh, very um, uh, are pretty difficult. They're not simple. They're not simplistic, so to say. They're not uh, uh, like very uh, many populists use a very simplistic language, right, to emphasize that they are part of. Yeah ordinary citizens, that they are not the elite. But this text was pretty complicated in terms of, uh, I don't know, uh, very long sentences, uh, uh, difficult words as well. Um, the message is still the good people versus the bad elite, but the way in which it was presented was, yeah, complicated language. So this simplistic style wasn't there when it comes to uh, the People's Party. The same is true for uh, organization. Uh, populist parties can have many different uh, uh, organizational structures. So the main conclusion uh, uh, I, 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 uh, I got from this analysis was that it's, it's the, 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 the features, uh, the, the ideational features. That is what these parties have in common. And there were four of them. Um, and uh, uh, there were uh, people centrism you just mentioned, uh, anti elitism, the homogeneity of the people, and the proclamation of a crisis. Uh, and important to emphasize, I think, is that one of the features that is often linked to populism, this uh, nationalistic exclusionism or nativism, that this one was not, should not be part of the definition of populism, was not part of the, uh, uh, was not part of all these uh, uh, parties and politicians. And I think this is an important finding because it indicates that it's important not to conflate exclusionism with populism or nativism, nationalist exclusionism. Yeah. And it makes sense, right? Because I studied populist parties and actors from with different ideologies. Um, and this exclusionism, nationalist exclusionism is basically only part of the far right uh, yeah. uh, groups and uh, far left populist parties are not exclusionistic in this sense. Yeah, I, I think I think people who have a background in Latin America, this makes sense to them. But people who yeah. who, who come from Europe uh, is is I mean, you you mentioned the European bias. This is the European yeah. bias. Yeah, very much. So mm -hmm. though I think I think there are leftist populists in uh, in. Uh, in Europe now that we can point to as potential, you know, counter arguments to 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 
claim saying that exclusion is part of populism uh yeah. we can take uh podemos in spain we can take uh, cities in greece i mean they're they're leftist populist parties uh to an extent uh, uh the democratic coalition of hungary which uh, some of the listeners might be familiar with might might actually uh, count as well. And we found quite a bit of populism uh, by Gyurcsán. After he left the Socialist Party, he, he really rebranded himself into this kind of populist uh, leader. He's not very successful because everybody remembers him as a, as a quite unsuccessful <laughs> prime minister, but, uh, but he's trying. He's definitely trying along the populist lines. So, yeah. so, uh, so yeah. So I, I, I think that's an important message that you know, do not conflate the radical right with populists because yeah, that yeah, that's not it. I think ideology is very important. In fact, I would say it's much more important than populism, which you know I say quietly yeah. because that's what we study. So we shouldn't say that it's not that important, but it's not that important. Ideology is much more important. There's a reason why it's been the center of political science for you know 75 years. So uh, yeah. so yeah. Yeah, I fully I fully agree. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's conclude. Um, how do you see this analysis uh, in in light of 10 years? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was I was rereading it before this meeting, and I was um, yeah. But what struck me was first of all what, what you just mentioned, right? This 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 Euro European bias. When I read it now, mm -hmm. I see this bias. I feel this bias a little bit. I, I feel that it, I, I see that it is written by a European and not by a Latin American scholar. And I think that's interesting. I, I also think it's 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 not really it it is self critique to some extent, but it's no one can escape this the the, the this yeah. right it, 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 yeah. it's 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 part of of, of where you uh, how you are uh, where you come from how you are trained as a scholar etc so this was one of the things that that struck me the second was um what i found interesting is that uh, i strongly emphasize here no three things by the way the, the second is <laughs> that i um uh, what i found interesting was that i uh, uh, i found that this um the uh, homogeneity of the people is so important. And that is what I found by looking at all these actors. Um, however, if you look at uh, uh, left-wing populist parties you just mentioned, right? Like Syriza, like Podemos, like uh, Mélenchon in uh, France as well. Um, these parties uh, and politicians to some extent have an have a homogenetic understanding of the people, but they also emphasize pluralism. Um, they are not, uh, they have a very different understanding of the people compared to far right-wing populists uh, yeah. who strongly emphasize the nation, right? And, and strongly emphasize that there are groups like immigrants, um, uh, for instance, that are not part of the nation, that are not part of the own group. So they have a very different understanding of the people by definition. And um, so I'm, I'm not really sure if you would categorize Syriza, Podemos, uh, the Dutch Socialist Party, the Linke in Germany, um, uh, Mélenchon in France, if you would consider them prototypical populists, if, right? I'm not sure if you would find that the homogeneity of the people would still be one of the core features. Hmm. That was the thing I was struggling with. But then, of course, it, de it depends on how you define it. Um, if you define it as they, they still have this homogenetic understanding of the people in opposition to the elite, right? So also yeah. left-wing populists who have a pluralistic understanding of the people to some extent argue that there is this elite that doesn't listen to ordinary citizens and I want the will of the people to be the point of departure again. This idea of the will of the people, right? The people taking back power also means that they, to some extent, have a very monolithic, a very uh, uh, um, homogenetic understanding of the people in political, in, in a political sense. They understand the people as the body that makes the political decisions. That is in itself homogenetic, although 
when it comes to uh, maybe economic or cultural understandings of the people there, they are, are pluralistic. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think it's very important how you define homogeneity of the people. Well, I mean, it's one of the problems of populism research in general is, is the definition of the people is heterogeneous. The definition yeah. of the elite is heterogeneous in very, yeah. very, very much. I mean, it could be political elite, it could be economic elite, it could be uh, some kind of uh, invisible elite, it could be yeah. uh, could be some made up uh, made up elite uh, that you know we could just point to. So, so I mean, this is very, very prevalent if you look at the United States, where where we had Bernie Sanders on the left and Donald Trump on the right finding yeah. some lead. Bernie Sanders is, is talking about Wall Street and bankers yeah. and, uh, and yeah. uh, Trump is talking about the political swamp. So, yeah. so it's, it's uh, I mean, we get the critique and it, to some extent it's, 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 it's valid that, uh, that uh, these concepts are so vaguely defined that they could be applied to anything. I don't think yeah. that's true, but I understand where the critique is coming from. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, yeah, and the, the thing is, it's it's very so so every populist basically has another elite and another people, yeah. um, but one populist always has one people and basically one elite. Although yeah. he or she might emphasize uh, the economic, uh, uh, the ba criticized bankers, uh, uh, politicians, etc. Often they would argue, well, these bankers and politicians, they're all together. They're all all part of the elite, right? The, the singular. Uh, and the people, singular, should take back uh, political decision-making power and should be given back uh, um, its voice, etc. There both are conceived of as, yeah, singular entities. Yeah. And that's, I think, is, that is, I think is, is important. So when it comes to the, the mess, the, the populist message of also of, far left-wing populists, it's always, um, yeah, homogeneity plays a very central role, but that doesn't mean that the uh, uh, that these populists, um, in all their descriptions of citizens, emphasize that it's one singular entity. They also uh, uh, acknowledge that there are many differences. And, 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 and often, when it comes to left-wing populists, even emphasize that it's important that there are differences and that it's good that there are differences. Yeah. All right. Um, so one last question. So you relegated crisis as not that important. Um, why Why did you do that? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I, I, I came up with the four uh, Characteristics, right? Those were the, yeah. the, the core features shared by all actors investigated. Um, but then, um, what I then did, I, I looked at the definitions out there, and most importantly, the ones by men, the, the ones mentioned by by Hawkins and by Mudder. And um, I found that um, these definitions do not very strongly emphasize this crisis. And then I started thinking about it, um, and. It's not that I um, think it's less important, but what I think that the, the idea of crisis is a necessary consequence of the other three concepts, or maybe uh, given what we just talked about, two of them. So the, the idea that there is the good people versus the evil elite, and that it's about this antagonistic relationship between the two, it's really that the one is good and the other is evil, and it's really... Uh, is it Manichaean, Manichaean? I never know how to pronounce this Manichaean. I, Manichaean. I think it's Manichaean, yeah. <laughs> this Manichaean uh, relationship between the two, right? It's really good and bad. Um, and um, um, this message, right? If, if, you, if, you, if you really say, think that the good people is exploited, corrupted, betrayed by the evil elite, this message has as a necessary consequence that you say that there is a crisis. So what I argue in the article is basically that the core of populism is the good people versus the evil elite. And then I also included this homogeneity uh, element. And that this, uh, this, this, this proclamation of a crisis is, always, is, is also always there. 
However, the reason is that this is a necessary consequence of this populist message. So basically, it is a consequence of the populist message, a necessary consequence, a consequence that will always be there because if you emphasize that the good people is betrayed, exploited uh, by an evil elite, you that, that by definition means that you proclaim that there is a crisis. So I framed it here as a consequence of yeah. this message. Yeah, in a sense, I almost feel like both of those things, like like the homogeneity of the people. If you if you see the people versus the elite, then you must see people somewhat homogeneous. You must see a crisis. Yeah. And uh, I just had a conversation about this with with Kirk Hawkins, and uh, and he, I I think he would go beyond. He would say that that uh, what you title here as uh, as a style, and and potentially also organization are just potential not necessary but potential yeah. consequences yeah. of yeah. people centrism and anti-elitism so simple language might just be one way of showing people centrism yeah. and anti-elitism direct communication is a way of showing people centrism yeah. and anti-elitism uh it doesn't always manifest that's why you don't find it always but but yeah. he would argue and i know many people would disagree with this especially the people who view populism as style or populism as organization that uh, that I, I i they would argue is wrong but but kirk would say that the ideational definition uh produces these kinds of manifestations in style and organization and that's yeah. why it's there yeah I, I i fully agree i think they are Correlates and they they often go together, right? Because what I just said, this this simplistic message, for instance, uh, it's not necessary. The People's Party didn't really have this simplistic message, but it does help populists to bring the message across, to uh, to 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 talk in a very uh, to use simple words, uh, not use complicated sentences. Um, but also to be uh, polarizing, for instance, a polarizing language that helps them to bring this, this Manichaean message of the people versus the elite across. And therefore, you will find uh, that many successful populist parties also use a simplistic language, polarizing la language, etc. But that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the case that they use it. It's not part of it. It's not a defining element of their populism. Mm -hmm. It is a... Yeah probable consequence but when it comes to this um uh, proclamation of a crisis my argument in in the article is that it's not a probable consequence but a necessary consequence it's yes. always there but it is still a consequence of this message yeah and I think we could we could we could say the same thing about Manichaean worldview because you you didn't have it as part of the twelve no even no, though true. It's, yeah. it's, it's argued yeah. as very central but yeah. if you have a conflict between the people and the elite that's by definition manichaean yeah 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 true yeah that that that's a good example that 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 is one of the uh one of the features that 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 could and maybe should have been part of the of the list of 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 of, of, of 12. it's interesting that i i think it was to some extent uh, in the proclamation of crisis, I I I I I I brought it under that heading, but I'm I think that should have been in a, a separate a separate uh, item there. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that makes sense if you view it that way. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for <laughs> talking to us about this article and uh, and uh, looking back at this. Where I brought you in a time machine ten years back, but uh, uh, so thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks.